Donald Virgil Bluth. The man, the myth, the legend. And also Gary Goldman. We keep forgetting about him. We need to stop doing that. Stop it. Get some help. Born September 13th, 1937, Don's entire life will be formed by Walt Disney Animation. However, in the 1970s following Walt Disney's death, the studio he dreamed of for so long was beginning to turn into a nightmare. With cheaper tactics, weaker movies, and the executives trying to play things way too safe, Don, Gary, and a couple others would all depart from Walt Disney Animation Studios on September 13th, 1979, his 42nd birthday. And within the next decade, Don and his team would go on to do the impossible. For the first time in their history, Walt Disney Animation would actually have a rival! <laughs> Working with some of the biggest names in all of Hollywood, Don and his team would go on to make some of the greatest animated films ever put together. They also made some stank shit. Yeah, Don has one of the most flip-floppy careers of probably any animator. Not a studio like DreamWorks or Sony. No, one single person leading the charge. And also Gary Goldman. Yeah, he did stuff too, I guess. But his impact on animation cannot be denied. He was able to challenge the masters of animation at their own game with their own tricks. The student really did become the master in this case. But a mixture of greedy executives who didn't trust Don's visions alongside his own hubris would end up ruining a lot of his movies in the early 90s. Hell, even he won't defend his movies. He knows what he did. He's the one who got sued, filed for bankruptcy multiple times, and even had to mortgage his own house just to keep his movies afloat. And just when it seemed like he was going to make the comeback of all time in 2000, Fox fumbled that ball so hard. They fumbled the shit out of it. Yeah, I think this tweet from That Daffy Duck, great Twitter name by the way, sums it up perfectly. The Don Blue falloff should be studied in schools because I struggle to think of another animation director who dropped a four pack of ass like this one after the other. Damn shame. He's absolutely right. It's fascinating how this happened. But Don's impact overall still cannot be denied. He basically brought to the mainstream the idea that Disney can indeed be challenged. Some rivals would come and go like Amblimation, but eventually another one of Disney's own would leave the studio to go and make his own. And say what you want about Katzenberg as a person, you can't deny DreamWorks made some banger films. And to think, it all started with a Mormon from El Paso, Texas who saw Snow White on the big screen when he was a kid and was never the same again. And since some of his movies are responsible for the same thing, I think he deserves one more roundabout. One last look over his career before we pack it up and move on to other more cursed horizons. And yes, I am well aware I still have some of his movie sequels to talk about, but he had nothing to do with those, so shut the fuck up. I'll get to them, okay? For now though, let's take one last look over the legacy that is Donald Virgil Bluth. Oh, and also Gary Goldman. Yeah, he's a part of this too, you know. Now, I won't be including his two short films in this ranking, since I don't think it's really fair to compare two 30-minute films to feature-length ones. But to basically recap those, the small one is great, Banjo not so much. Now, with that out of the way, let's begin. I'm so bored. B -b 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 boring So boring. I'm so bored. B -b 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 boring Well, this is it, guys. The literal bottom of the barrel. It doesn't get any worse than this. If you've been keeping up with my videos up till now, then you know exactly which one this is. I had a miserable time watching this one again, and I have no intention of ever coming back to it. Ladies and gentlemen, the worst Don Bluth movie of all time is definitively Titan A.E. I'm sorry. I know exactly which movie you thought was going to be at the bottom, and don't worry, you'll see it soon enough. But guys... This is such a miserable film. I mean, with A Troll in Central Park, I at least feel something while watching that movie. I feel anger. I feel disgust. I even feel violent tendencies. But with Titan A.E., I felt absolutely nothing. Titan A.E. isn't offensive or disturbing or stupid. Well, okay, it's kind of stupid, but it's not like A Troll in Central Park at all. It is Dull. It is the most boring movie I have ever seen in my entire life, with one of the most generic stories and with some of the most generic characters you could possibly come up with. The main character is an edgy asshole. The comic relief is obnoxious. The vagina is a vagina! The main antagonist is a fucking idiot. How the hell am I supposed to be intimidated by this guy when he forgot to close the door while saying out loud that he's gonna betray the main characters? You fucking dumbass! 
The villains are a joke too. They have zero personality and their designs are hilariously bad. Even the animation sadly just isn't good. Outside of a couple cool sequences like the opening where the earth blows up, the 2D and 3D do not mesh well at all. It's distracting, it looks almost unfinished at times, and the 3D environments have not aged well at all. <laughs> Not like I don't get it though, this movie was rushed and then forced to be completed in only 19 months. Don didn't want to make this fucking movie, he didn't have a choice. Fox held a gun to his head and told him to either make the film or kick rocks. And he would sadly end up doing both, alongside 300 animators in one of the biggest layoffs in animation history. Even bigger than Treasure Planet. What a sick joke. I do feel bad for everyone who worked on it and tried their best to make this work, but I'm sorry. This is one of the worst animated movies I've ever seen, and yet it's not even worth getting mad over. I don't blame Don one bit for this movie though. It was clearly the executives at Fox who really fumbled the bag in this case. Doesn't change the fact that this movie left zero impression on me at all. I didn't watch it as a kid, and frankly, I'm glad I skipped out. Y'all can like this movie if you want. I'm well aware this is going to be one hell of a hot take to some of you, but I want to see movies that are interesting interesting, for better or for worse. I'll take a batshit insane movie that makes me angry over a generic mess that makes me feel nothing. This movie is slowly fading away from my memory even as I speak. Even Tech, the best part of this movie, is slowly fading away as well. Sleep well, dear prince. Wait, what were we talking about again? Oh, not that piece of shit! Why don't you take a seat? Take a seat, right over there. Suck it! Asshole liquor dead fart! Yeah. You know how bad this movie is. Even though Titan AE is the most boring movie Don ever made, I think this is oddly the most boring movie to talk about because frankly, what is there to say that hasn't been said already? Everyone knows it. I know it's bad. You know it's bad. We all know it's bad. Is there anyone out there who doesn't think this movie's bad? Meow. I'm out of here. This movie is so fucking obnoxious. I think those annoying baby videos you see on YouTube respect its audience more than this trite does. The story is practically non-existent. When the baby starts crying, the movie will come to a complete screeching halt just to get her to shut the fuck up. If I could, I would kick this baby through a field goal and the world would be better for it. And I'll do it again, like taking candy from a baby. Which is fine by me. Come here, you fucking baby. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow, what are you doing? Oh my god, it's an actual baby getting his ass whooped! <laughs> This movie has really weird overtones that they definitely did not think through when making this movie. I mean, the main antagonist wakes up to a baby crying and gets all giddy about it? Also, the main character gets kissed by a two-year-old and gets really giddy about it? Don, do we need to have a talk? How about you have a seat over here? Okay, I don't think Don had any ill intentions when writing this. If anything, he's come out and disowned this movie for very good reasons. The only positives I can really say about this movie is the animation, one of the songs is tolerable, I guess, and the voice acting is actually pretty good. Dom DeLuise did not have to go this hard on such a god-awful character, but that's just how passionate he was as a voice actor, and I think that deserves credit. Honestly, what else is there to say? It's bad. You know it's bad. Even Dawn knows it's bad. I think it's best for us to just leave this troll down under the bridge to rot. For good. Baby starts beating him back. <laughs> <laughs> He's tracking rushing! That baby's doing strings! <laughs> <gasps> chicken! Pet the chicken! Pet the chicken! You guys like Rockadoodle? <laughs> so yeah, that video kind of took off, and people were not happy about it. Which is fine, y'all can like whatever you want. But why are y'all booing me for? I'm right! Rockadoodle is so fucking bad, you guys. Just such an obnoxious movie with a world that doesn't make any sense the more you think about it. The live action portions just feel so tagged on and unnecessary. Almost like it was trying to be like a certain other live action animation hybrid movie that was very successful and made a lot of money. There are so many gaping plot holes in this movie. Like how exactly did the sun come up in the beginning of the movie? The movie never explains this. Well, apparently there was an interview that Don took part in where he explains why the sun came up in the beginning. Apparently the sun had gotten so used to hearing Chanticleer singing that it just came up out of instinct. But when it didn't hear him, it went back down, which is A, really stupid, and B, not in the final picture so it doesn't even matter. You see, these things have to actually be in the movie in order to take them into account. 
The director saying that was the intention is not the same thing as it actually being in the movie. The characters are all awful, just really annoying, not much character there. The one voiced by Mandark loves lasagna, and the one voiced by Baloo can't tie his shoes. Wow, what a great character. Edmund fucking sucks. He's such an annoying character, and his voice actor has one of the most obnoxious voices I've ever heard. He actually gives Adam Sandler's Whitey a run for its money. Oh, boo! You're making fun of a kid. Fuck that kid. If I could, I would kick this kid to a field goal, and the world would be better for it. If you're gonna be in a movie, you have to brace yourself for criticism, no matter how old you are. Deal with it. The Duke of Owls is, like, the only character that's somewhat passable. Like, you can tell Christopher Plummer had a fun time voicing him, even though he's just as childish as the rest of the movie is. I mean, one of the songs he has has the lyrics, Tweedly D, Tweedly D, they're running out of batteries. Someone got paid to put this on a piece of paper somewhere. Twiddly D, Twiddly D, Twiddly D's nuts, dude! But hey, at least we actually hear that song. Almost every other song has a dumbass narrator over top of it explaining what the song should itself be explaining. How am I supposed to enjoy the songs, which some of them are actually pretty good, when there's someone talking over it? It's annoying and goes against everything that a musical is supposed to do. It's stupid. It's nonsensical. It's just bonkers. It's a dumb movie, and so many people who defended it only did so out of nostalgic connection for it or because it's a kid's movie and doesn't have to try. Sorry, but you guys do remember who made this movie, right? No one was mad at this movie? Yeah, no one was mad at this movie. Only critics, audiences, and even the studio Goldcrest who would go on to sue Don Blue for $300,000 to try and cover the film's financial losses. Yeah, no one was mad at this movie. You guys can like this acid trip of a piece of shit if you want, but I don't get it. I never will get it, and frankly, with shit like this in there, I'm not too sure that I want to. I killed a man with this thumb. When I heard that Thumbelina was written in only two weeks, suddenly it all made sense. This script was clearly so rushed and had no time to actually develop its characters, story, themes, etc. Outside of the animation and some decent songs here and there, this movie is just so all over the place and it's really repetitive. It's just Thumbelina being kidnapped by some horny guy or whatever. They want to marry her, but she wants to marry this other guy who broke into her house and also only knew her for five minutes. But he's super cute, so it's cool when he wants to do it. Everyone else who wants to marry me just because I'm beautiful is a creep, though. But that's a lesson that little girls should be taking from this movie, right? That a woman's entire self-worth should be determined by a handsome white dude with a beautiful voice. Or at least that's what the gay stereotype Swallow tells me. Love that, by the way. Thumbelina is just a carbon copy of Ariel from The Little Mermaid without any of the new ones. You know those people who keep saying that Ariel left her home behind and traded her fins for legs because of a man and nothing else? Oh wait, Ariel herself said that? Jesus Christ, this movie's gonna be so bad. Well, Thumbelina is the Ariel that Ariel says Ariel is. Her whole entire character revolves around specifically finding love, and in the first 20 minutes, that's exactly what she finds. It's vapid, it's shallow, and just feels so old school, but not in a good way. By 1994, Disney had learned to recapture the magic of classic Disney, while at the same time, evolving with the times to make them feel more modern. Thumbelina just feels like a relic from a bygone era. But again, it was only written in two weeks, which definitely explains why Mary the Mole was so fucking terrible. If there are ghosts, that means there's an afterlife! Heaven! Hell! Am I going to hell? You know, I was really hoping that this time around, All Dogs Go to Heaven would finally click. After watching All Dogs Go to Heaven 2 and realizing how truly terrible this movie was, I thought to myself, maybe I was too hard on the first one. At least it's not the second one, right? So was it better this time around? No, it was actually a little worse. Sorry, but this movie is just such a tonal clusterfuck, and it really makes you wonder, who was this movie made for? In the same movie that has gambling, drinking, murder, and badass depictions of hell, you also have songs about sharing, like this is the fucking Teletubbies. Seriously, I'll never get over my hatred for that song. That song sounds like it belongs in a troll in Central Park. I'm not kidding. The songs are pretty forgettable. The story forgets it has an antagonist for like 30 minutes, which is really weird considering the entire story is about making the antagonist pay for what he did to the main character. So where'd he go? The alligator scene is just a huge acid trip that has almost 
no bearing on the story whatsoever. Yeah, that's the biggest issue with this movie. The first 25 minutes of the film show great promise. It's a solid setup for Charlie's character arc and his relationship with Anne-Marie. But sadly, once she enters the film, the story gets easily distracted with shenanigans that have really nothing to do with Carface. The movie just forgets he exists altogether, and instead we get pointless filler scenes like that dumb sharing song and that alligator number. The movie just feels so aimless with its script, like it just has too much going on for its own good. It's not all bad though, and Maria is a great character, boosted greatly by the performance of the late Judith Barzi. That scene where Itchy breaks down in tears about how Charlie turned his back on him is really well done and well delivered. The first 25 minutes, again, are pretty good, and that scene in hell? Oh my god. God, they did not have to go that hard. So hard that a part of it had to be cut out of the final product since it was deemed too scary. That shit was raw. I loved that. It has good stuff, it has bad stuff, it's overall a pretty mixed bag that is just totally confused and can't stay focused when it comes to its narrative. I can't in good faith say it's a good movie, but with that being said, I get the appeal. I can totally see what people like about this movie, it's just too confused for my liking. But hey, at least it's better than its sequel. I know that's not saying a lot, but it's definitely better than that. That's a nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. Easily the most mid-movie on this entire list. It's definitely better than any of the other movies from this time period, and I dare say it's perfectly harmless, but that's about as far as I'd go. It's pretty whatever, honestly. The characters are fine, the songs are fine, animation is fine. Well, mostly. Those animation errors are actually pretty funny, to be honest. See, that's why most of my initial review was mainly meme hyping. I I just thought it was hilarious how our main characters were secretly gay as fuck, and the movie would have been way better with them getting together in the end instead. Also, penguins are fucked up animals that will literally sexually violate children and corpses. I will never watch Happy Feet the same way again, given how sexually charged that movie is. I still think Drake was pretty worthless as a character, and could have easily been written out of the film with some retooling. Drip, on the other hand? Fucking Chad. Best character in the movie, easily. I want to die! Can't hurt me! Explain to me, what does it mean to be thick? What? People tell me that I'm, quote, thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. You know, I almost forgot to include this one. But then I remember that scene where the lady turned into a dragon and became super dummy thick. And then I remember this movie is honestly kind of mid too. There's honestly not a lot to add from my original review. The movie's fine. The animation is pretty good considering it's a direct-to-video film. My only real gripe with it is that its message is still pretty fucked. You shouldn't have to be manipulated into helping somebody. That's not a good message, you guys. Overall, it's fine. Perfectly fine movie. Songs are fine. Characters fine. It's all around just fine. Perfectly harmless movie, and I'm never gonna watch it again. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Our guest of honor, Father Rasputin. While rewatching Anastasia, I came to a really interesting discovery that I didn't realize in my initial review. I've come to realize that the liar revealed element in this movie is actually pretty bad. Why didn't Dimitri just lead with the music box right away? That would have immediately earned the Queen's trust and saved everyone a whole lot of hassle. Dimitri would have brought Anya home, they'd live happily ever after, and my boy Vlad actually gets his reward in the end. Seriously, why did he just disappear at the end of the movie? Like, where did he go? I also still think Rasputin is a pretty weak antagonist. The only reason he keeps failing is because of the main character's insane plot armor. This guy has fucking giant demons on his side, and he can't kill a single person? What a little bitch! And of course, there is the Russian-sized elephant in the room involving this movie's historical inaccuracies, but other than those problems, pretty good movie actually. Out of all the Don Bluth movies, this one has the best songs by far. Even the weaker songs are by no means bad songs, and the good songs are really good. Once Upon a December is so breathtaking with its lyrics and visuals, Journey to the Past is a beautiful I Want song, and dude, they did not have to go so hard on In the Dark of the Night. That shit slaps so hard it should legally be considered assault. The animation is spectacular. This is probably the best looking out of all of Don's movies. From that cool mosaic sky of Paris to the brilliant use of color, it's such a beautiful movie. Anya is a great main character. Her chemistry with the other characters is really tight and well written, and when she does find her grandmother, it's genuinely a satisfying scene to watch despite the weak liar revealed stuff surrounding it. As I said before, it doesn't reach the same highs as his 80s stuff, and I guess you could make the argument that this is just another Disney knockoff that's only trying to ride the train that 
Disney started this decade, but as knockoffs go, it's still really well done. You can't deny the amount of genuinely great musical numbers, animated sequences, and characters that come from this movie. It's undeniably flawed for sure, but definitely a huge step in the right direction for Don following his previous four films. If Fox just didn't fumble the bag as hard as they did with Titan AE, then there's no telling just how far Don could have gone should he kept on making movies like this one. Of course, he'd just end up going to Blue Sky and, well, <laughs> that didn't last either, now did it? At least it would have made the money. You've done well so far, but up until now, I've only been using a mere 5% of my power. Now let's see how well you fare against my Biden Blast! Well, here we are, guys. The top three. The movies that made Don the legend that he is today. It's not every day you break away from the titan of animation and then with some help of Hollywood's biggest names, go on to give them a genuine challenge. And yeah, they're all pretty great films. An American Tale is the weakest of them all, though. Yeah, I still have some gripes here and there. I still think Tiger is pretty useless as a character. He shows up like 50 minutes in and doesn't really contribute to anything. You could have easily cut out their song number and it wouldn't affect the plot at all. I also think the songs are a mixed bag. Some are out there and a duo are pretty good, but there are no cats in America and Never Say Never are pretty meh. But outside of that, this movie is insanely smart. It has such a profound political theme that's aged surprisingly well despite its target audience. It's not every animated movie for kids that shows us the separation between the classes of rich and poor or the corrupt politicians that you're forced to tolerate just for the slight hope of change. That there's always gonna be some schmuck out there who takes advantage of that separation for their own benefit regardless of who suffers because of it. It's a great deconstruction of the American dream all while telling a sweet story about a kid who simply wants to be reunited with his family. The story doesn't pull any punches either. It is absolutely ruthless when it comes to punishing our main character. The poor kid just wants to find his family and the world is kicking this kid through a field goal. Man, the world just hates kids, doesn't it? It has the second best score of any Don Blue film thanks to James Horner's beautiful score, although you can probably guess what the best one is, and the ending is just perfect. Don and Gary really knocked out of the park with this one. Special thanks to Steven Spielberg who gave them just the right amount of control to make a smart, gorgeous, and emotionally resonant masterpiece. Oh shit! A rat! While my childhood didn't miss out on Rockadoodle or Titan AE, The Secret of Nim is definitely a gem I missed out on. My video on this movie mainly focused on the negative things about it because I think most fans of Don Bluth know just how good it is already. And yeah, it's really freaking good. My problems are still valid though. I still hate Jeremy with all of my being, but fortunately he's not in the movie for that long. He has very little plot relevancy and you could have easily written him out of the final draft. I also still think Jenner had the potential to be a really smart three-dimensional antagonist. Instead of just being an angry rat who swings his sword a lot and just wants to be boss, you could have really given him a different insight on how the rats should run things in their society. Maybe try to write him to where he doesn't see himself as the villain and that the change that's going on around him is only going to hurt the rats as a whole. Imagine how timeless a villain like that could be. A villain who fights against change simply because he doesn't agree with it and doesn't want to see other people's viewpoints. But no, he's just kind of a one-note jerk-off who wants to rule over the rats because I get it, he's only supposed to represent the fear of change as opposed to being a product of that fear. But outside of those two things, you have one of the smartest, darkest, and most mature animated films I've ever seen. It's not every day you see a main protagonist who's as realistic and relatable as Mrs. Brisby. The fact that she's so skittish and fearful all the time, and yet she's always willing to do what's necessary for her kid. Like in the opening when she goes to stop the plow, but she actually failed to do that because she gave in to her fear. She was frozen stiff and Auntie Shrew had to come and save her. And even then, she was still having a panic attack, not knowing what to do now that her husband is gone. So from that point on, she works even harder to make sure that doesn't happen again. Her development throughout the film feels so natural and believable as she not only succeeds in saving her son, but learning about the rats, Nim, and just who her husband was all along. So when she bravely decides to help them with their plan, it's totally understandable. The pacing, the subtlety, the themes, Man, movies like this just don't happen, at least not that often. It's a movie that truly captured the classic Disney feel, while at the same time bringing in something fresh and new, having a story that's equally as mature and respectful towards its audience as its animation is flawless. Despite my gripes with Jenner, he still serves as a legitimate threat and he works well enough for what he's supposed to be. The other characters aren't super deep or anything, but there's a likable and genuine charm to them all that really helps them stand out more. What else did I even say? It's great. I 
I know it's great. You know it's great. We all know it's great. Is there anyone out there who doesn't think this movie's great? That's what I thought, bitch. It's an astonishing 9 out of 10 film, and I can perfectly see why Don himself chose this film as his personal favorite in his entire collection. But I'm not Don Bluth, am I? There's only one movie left, and if you follow me long enough, you knew what it was from the beginning. Don't lose your way with each passing day. Yeah, it's pretty much perfect. I've talked about this movie a million times, and I'm probably going to do it a million more times. It just doesn't get any better than this. For starters, it gave us God. I mean, instantly number one just for that reason alone. It's not even a contest, honestly. I could stop there, but fuck it, let's keep going. This is just one of those movies where I have practically zero issue with it. And the only gripes I have are really minor nitpicks. Like, for example, why didn't we see Petrie be born the same way we saw the others? How did those kids get out of the tar pit? Why did Littlefoot's mom put him on her back when he was bored? He's gonna fall off! Frankly, those aren't even worth bringing up. Even though I just did. But I promise you, they don't matter. Seriously, for every tiny, baby, cherry-sized misstep this movie made, it surpassed it so much with everything else. It's like comparing Raditz to Whis. Like, what are you even doing with your life to make that comparison? The animation is flawless. The colors, the character designs, the backgrounds. This movie is beyond timeless. Despite turning 35 this year in November, it still looks just as good now as it did back in 1988. Every artist who touched this film with their pencils and paintbrushes are demigods because we all know there can only be one god. I still can't get over how awesome that fight scene with the sharp tooth is. It's easily up there as one of the great animated battles, like Hiccup and Toothless versus the Red Death, or Prince Philip versus Maleficent. The colors, the intensity, just the grand scale of it all. And of course, the scene that follows it, well, let's just say it affects me more than it ever did when I was a kid. The way this film handles its themes of racism, segregation, prejudice, and many others is all handled perfectly. I love how these kids are all the byproducts of their surroundings, which perfectly explains why they are the way they are. Sarah's father is a bigoted racist, so it only makes sense for Sarah to be one too. And yet later in the movie, when Littlefoot also tries to have that mentality when he meets Ducky, he can't stick with it because he doesn't understand it. He can't comprehend the idea that they can't be friends simply because they're different. Mainly because Littlefoot's mother, for the time that she was alive, instilled into him good traits that make him a good person. But he's still just a kid by the end of the day. He's stubborn, gets emotional easily, starts fights when things don't go his way. He's like an actual kid. They're all like actual kids. I love that. Compare Littlefoot to Sarah, who only knows about bigotry and racism. She doesn't question it because that's pretty much all she knows. Why would she question it? But as she spends more time with the group and slowly begins to realize she doesn't know all the answers, it starts to sink in and just how wrong she was. That scene where she walks away after almost getting everyone killed because of her choice, and yet still being unable to admit her mistake, so she just starts crying? That's how a real kid acts. Oh, it's just so good. My only real major issue, again, is all the stuff that ended up being cut out for being too scary, I wish they kept in. But it's not like I don't get it. Major props to the editors, though, who made it all work so seamlessly. As a kid, you never would have guessed it got cut down so hard. Even with the cut content, it still feels so natural. Man, I really gotta come back for a full re-review of this movie. It's just that good. Remind me in November, will you guys? And as for a 24-hour video dedicated to our Lord and Savior himself? Well, we'll wait till it hit a million subscribers. And we can't do that if you don't subscribe, fun fact. I have so much more to say about this masterpiece. It's just truly one of the most perfect films I've ever seen. Movies like The Lamb Before Time only show up about once every five to ten years. The Lamb Before Time, The Prince of Egypt, Spirited Away, How to Train Your Dragon, Spider-Verse, these are movies that are going to stand the test of time and become a huge part of people's childhoods for generations to come. And no amount of cheap, dumb, direct-to-video sequels can ever take away the majesty that this movie brings. It truly is a masterpiece. One that can only come from Donald Virgil Bluth. But I bet you already knew that. His career is definitely one of the more interesting ones. Like, how do you go from making genre-defining classics to pure, utter shit 
all within the span of a decade. It's crazy. Was it the influence of people like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas that helped make those movies as good as they are? Or was it the executives who constantly kept making demand after demand of Don and his team to make compromises that destroyed the final product? Or maybe those great movies were all flukes and Don was just never a good filmmaker to begin with. Critics. These questions will always be asked and some might have been answered already. But regardless, his impact on the world of animation cannot be denied. He was Disney's first true rival. He reminded them just what people loved about classic Disney in the first place, and it would later go on to inspire them to go back to their roots. So in a way, Don Bluth did help inspire the Disney Renaissance. Some of Disney's greatest movies like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King might not have happened were it not for Don challenging them. If he hadn't stood up to the heads of Disney at the time, who knows what direction they would have gone in, or if they'd even still be around. God, could you imagine if Disney did go bankrupt in the 80s and wasn't able to bounce back? The world of animation would be a completely different place. Jeffrey Katzenberg might have never gone on to make Dreamworks Animation. Chris Wedge might have never gone on to make Blue Sky. Can't be killed if you're never born. Now, of course, this is all speculation. Maybe Disney would have been fine without Don challenging them. Maybe they would have gone back to their roots either way but it probably would have taken longer. Because when the guy you were training to basically become the next Walt Disney decides to walk away and then proceeds to kick your fucking ass all around the block, twice, right after you crash your own car at that, that's when you know you gotta straighten up. He reminded us that kids can be treated with respect and deserve to be treated with respect. That animation movies can try to enrich you just as much as entertain you. That animated movies are supposed to stick with you because they're often the first movies we ever see. What else is there to say? Don may have had his ups and downs, his ups incredibly high, and his downs all the way to the bottom of hell, but you can't say he didn't love animation. For better or for worse, he stuck to his guns all the way through to the bitter end and you kind of have to respect him for that. All he ever wanted to do was what he dreamed of, and he did. We'll remember the moments that made Don Bluth the animation legend. My past and bring me home at Oh, and Gary, of course, too. They're the dynamic duo. We can't forget him. Remember Gary, too, you guys.